Good evening, you're viewing Ion Government, a production of the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. This evening, Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez addresses the United Nations General Assembly on Biodiversity. After 36 years, the Ministry of Education Schools Feeding Program stands committed to providing nutritional meals for pre- and primary school children. The National Cultural Foundation, NCF, receives Canadian funding for women in craft and culture. The Kingstown Public Library joins the world in celebrating International Day for Universal Access to Information. And the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Digital Dialogues hosts webinar on faith and pandemic. These stories will follow Newswatch. Let's join the API's Janice and Philip at the news desk. Good evening, I am Janice St. Philip. This is Newswatch. The Caribbean Examinations Council has officially released preliminary results for the June-July examinations, along with a review and analysis of the results. This year, 22% of the passes were Grade 1 level, 37.62% at Grade 2 level, and 40.30% at Grade 3. Paige Cadogan of Girls High School was the most outstanding student who sat 15 subjects and obtained 14 grade 1s and 1 grade 2. The top 5 schools who have percentage pass rates in excess of 80% are Girls High School with a pass rate of 97.88%, St. Martin Secondary School with 94.48%, the Bequay Seventh-day Adventist School with 94.19%, St. Vincent Grammar School with 93.32%, and the St. Joseph's Convent Kingstown with a 87.91% pass rate. The National Cultural Foundation will be hosting a series of workshops for women in craft and culture at the newly constructed Development Center for the Arts beginning on Monday, October 5, 2020. Director of the National Cultural Foundation, Julian Pollard, said women can take advantage of this country's unique and rich heritage. Over 60 women are expected to participate in the craft component of the workshop and will run for four weeks. We have in Vincent what is called the true weave, which is used in the straw pandanas. And it's used in a technique that has been handed down from generation to generation for years and years. It's like nothing I've seen anywhere else in the Caribbean because the way that these ladies do their technique is different than anywhere else. And I know that with the right marketing, we can sell this, well, I'll have to say worldwide because not just in the Caribbean region. The Mustique Charitable Trust, in collaboration with the University of the West Indies, UWI Open Campus, will officially hand over bursaries to three Open Campus students on Friday, October 2, 2020, at 2.30 p.m. The ceremony will be held at the library of the Open Campus. The bursaries include the presentation of a laptop to each bursary recipient, facilitated by the head of the UWI Open Campus, Deborah Dalrymple, and director of the Mustique Charitable Trust, Dullery Malcolm. The 2020 bursary awardees are Karina Arundel, Akil Matthews, and Kenika Thompson. The UWI Open Campus have extended an open invitation to the media in attending the ceremony. Thanks for watching. This is News Watch. I am Janice St. Philip. Stay tuned as the API's Iron Government program continues with Sheridan Lewis. As parents, 
We have the responsibility to ensure that our child or children are safe and ready for the reopening of school. In this phase of reopening, all confirmed cases of COVID-19 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are imported or import-related, with no community spread. However, while we strive to achieve some level of normalcy, we highly recommend adherence and compliance, as we continue together to reduce the risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Talk to your child to reinforce what is expected of him or her during this time. Remind your child to wash their hands frequently with soap and running water. In the absence of such, a 70% alcohol-based hand sanitizer can be used. If both are absent, children are advised to keep their unwashed hands out of their eyes, nose and mouth. Cover their nose and mouth when sneezing or coughing with a tissue and immediately dispose of it. In the absence of tissue, sneeze or cough into their elbow, not their hands. As parents, we also have a responsibility to ensure that your child or children's temperature is checked and recorded. If a temperature reading is 38 degrees Celsius or 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit and above, please call the COVID-19 hotline and a healthcare provider will advise you accordingly. If the reading is below, your child is good to go. During school, if they are unwell, they should report it to the teacher or parent immediately. If you or your child are experiencing any flu-like symptoms, please stay at home and call your nearest health center and share your history. A healthcare provider will talk you through the procedures to follow. Children who must take public transportation should wear face mask coverings en route, one for the morning journey and another for after school. The flu and coronavirus COVID-19 can cause serious illnesses, even death. Please protect yourself and your family. Welcome back. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonzalez at the 75th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations addressed matters surrounding global biodiversity and COVID-19 among other issues. Here's more of the Prime Minister's message. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we meet today against a worrying backdrop of global biodiversity challenges and failures, a deepening climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. Our world is badly wounded. The only salve is multilateral cooperation, sharing best practices, taking action at home, and being good neighbors to one another in this global village. Global partnerships, including those between governments, the private sector, and civil society, are absolutely vital. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have found ways to promote major industries and to protect biodiversity simultaneously. For instance, in 2018, we installed a coral reef early warning system in the Tobago Keys. This site was chosen based on its value to the tourism sector and the richness of the marine biodiversity. In 2018, a decision was taken to work with the businesses and consumers to reduce demand for single-use plastics and accelerate communications on the value of ecosystems, thereby reducing biodiversity loss and optimizing the economic benefits. In addition, we have banned the hitherto ubiquitous styrofoam containers, often used for food. We are employing much better ways to regulate the disposal of grey water from coastal businesses and effluent from yachts and other pleasure craft. We plan to protect further our reefs by restricting the types of sunscreen and by swimmers, used by swimmers and divers and beach goers. We are taking comprehensive action that will slow beach degradation and protect our coastal assets. Coastal and river defenses are being put in place, but it is all very costly for a vulnerable small island developing state like ours. I take this opportunity to commend Vincentians, both individuals and businesses, 
for the actions they are taking to protect our rich biodiversity and our environment as a whole. From the initiative by All Island Recycling to place garbage bins on almost every corner in our capital, to the Ashton Multipurpose Cooperative, a small enterprise working to conserve the marine and coastal ecosystems in Union Island. So too, I thank our international partners for working with us to foster even better cooperation and partnerships. But still, as always, much more needs to be done. Excellencies, collectively, the world is lagging way behind in achieving the goals of the three Rio Conventions on climate change, desertification, and biodiversity, integral parts of a composite whole on which our very survival depends. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought into focus the dangers of destroying biodiversity, as well as underscoring our dependency on each other. Let us build back, not just build back better, but to build back optimally and enduringly for all humanity's sake. A high representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will co-chair this leader's dialogue. Thank you. That was Prime Minister Gonzales addressing the 75th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Iron Government continues in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome to Opportunity Calls, where we inform you on vacancies within the government service, opportunities for training, scholarships, and much more. Stay tuned as an opportunity might just be calling you. Applications are invited for suitably qualified persons for scholarships offered by the British High Commission. Chevening Scholarships are the UK government's global scholarship program funded by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FOC, and partner organisations. The scholarship supports studies at UK universities for individuals with demonstrable potential to become future leaders, decision makers, and opinion formers. Applicants are asked to submit their online application to www.chevening.org slash apply. For more information, you can visit our Facebook page at API SVG. The following is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Oh, new snacks on the market. I show my children love this. Yeah. Really? Yeah. New snacks? Yeah. Very eye-catching. Yeah. Look at the amount of sodium or salt in this. I would buy this for my child. And I bought this too. I never know the pack with so much sodium. Choose snacks that are less than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving. Less salt, healthier life. A message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. The Ministry of Education Schools Feeding Program, after 36 years, is still going strong. The program continues to fulfill its mandate to provide a nutritional supplement to children attending pre- and primary schools across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. On Wednesday, September 30, 2020, the API visited the Dixon Methodist and Georgetown Primary Schools to get an update on their school feeding programs, respectively.
name is Satasha Glasgow. I work at the Dixon Methodist School as the cook. Most people in my area know me as Tasha. I try my very best to give the children nutritious food and stuff like that. And as you all know, I'm the only worker in the kitchen. So I'm doing my best and I'm looking forward for more years to working at the Dixon Methodist School because I have no problem with the teachers, neither the children. So everything is good. So how long you have been here thus far? I've started working from the 5th of February 2007. What's in the pot today? Um, Lanty peas, like water, um, pumpkin, breadfruit, and dump coconut dumpling and dashing. Yes. Normally you offer breakfast, but that was on pause, and you said soon yeah. you'll be offering breakfast again. Yeah. Um, well, the breakfast program... It was on pause too because of the corona and school not open, but we will start back by Monday, God's, God's willing. And what are some of the items on the menu for breakfast? Um, bread and tuna or crackers, uh, bread and egg, and fruit juice and milk, or corn flakes and milk. Do you have a lot of wastage? Well, according to what kind of food you cook, yes. But I love macaroni, um, macaroni and minced meat and stuff like that. And most children like they fed up at the rice. So we must try our best to like bring whatever we have home to do like soup and stuff like that for them. I'm here with the principal, Mrs. Williams, and the grade six teacher, Miss Kwashi, and both are going to say something about the school feeding program here at Dixon. I'll start with the principal. Okay. The school feeding program at our school, I think it is very beneficial to the students here. We live in a small community where most of the parents are single parents. The children come from a single parent household. So having lunch here um, is a plus for them because they only pay 50 cents per day and they get a balanced diet. And two or four days on the school feeding program, we give them water, so not juice every day. We have our water days where we practice them to drink water because children like to always be drinking juice. So we say no juice, water. And on Wednesdays, we have a fruit day where we encourage them to eat fruits and not the junk food, the snacks. Ms. Kwashi, tell us how many students are on the school feeding program? The feeding, field school feeding program has 79 pupils on board, at least 74 pupils eat every day. Now that school has resumed, what's the atmosphere in the class? It's very good. Mrs. keep telling us, trying to work hard, we don't have a lot of time before the CPE and she wants good results so we must study our books and do more. We are now at the Georgetown Primary School and we are in the kitchen and with me we have two members of the staff who are responsible for the school feeding program. Okay, my, good morning, and my name is Chesil Ann Harper, and my co-worker here is Small B. And today is Wednesday, and on the menu we have calorie soup and red bean soup. Well, today the lower juniors will be having the pea soup, and the higher juniors will be, doing, will be eating the calorie soup. We normally interchange it because of sometimes we don't normally get calorie. What is it like walking in the kitchen and being around the school children? 
Yeah, it is a nice, great pleasure to be with the children and everything is all right and they, they are not too rude or everything. They are behaving themselves. How long have you been on the program? I am on the program for about nine years now. Yeah. Same, I'm here about nine years. Only means she's just three or four months ahead of me. But I used to, I take up the work from my mother. So I used to always frequent the kitchen. So. With me is Miss Kimberly Richards. She is a grade three teacher. And she would just tell us a little bit about the school feeding program here. On the school feeding program, we cater mainly for um, the nutritional needs of the children. So on the program, we have like... Uh, meals that cater for that. We have like Kalaloo soup, we have stewed chicken, we have um, vegetable rice and those sorts of stuff that would cater for the nutritional needs of the children. On average we have about 214 children that um, take daily meals on the feeding program. Um, the children enjoy the meals. Um, some children normally come for seconds. <laughs> and so um, it's a pleasure being a part of the, um, the school feeding program, seeing the children enjoy their meal, the staff. They are very dedicated to their work and make sure that everything is in place, even the day before they left, so that everything runs smoothly the morning when they come to work. We have um, a lot of um, parents who are very satisfied with the, feed, um, the school feeding program. In fact, they would like call and ask if the child bring their money to pay for the f uh, feeding program because you know sometimes you give the money for the children to pay and they don't pay and they would call and make sure that the child gave their money because some of them are working and it's um, very tiring and bothersome to get up in the morning to prepare meals and stuff like that. So the parents um, are very grateful for the program and the school in general i think that uh, we are happy to be having a program like this also on mornings um the children um, can partake of um, their breakfast um, from the Tusty um, program we have like um, four or six children per class would come every morning to the kitchen where they would have their healthy breakfast hot meals they'll have things like um, cornmeal porridge their oats their fruit juice and I think that um, the children are very appreciative of this um, venture. I saw you putting the bowl by your head. It's good soup, right? Yeah. You look like you love to eat. Well, actually, you don't look it, but you look so. I love to eat plenty food, but I don't come fat. Just like me. <laughs> What's your name? Joriana Masaya. Oh, it's your daughter. Oh, oh Lord. <laughs> It's good, it's healthy, it gives me healthy food. It makes me go taller, I guess. I can see that. So you're not eating on the school feeding program? Mm -hmm. Somebody's bringing you lunch? Yeah. Do you know what you'll be getting for lunch today? Pizza. Pizza. You like pizza? I like lettuce with tomato. Very good. My name is Samara are you enjoying your meal? Yeah. What's your favorite meal? Most of the time we don't offer anything fry at all. So that it's because it's more nutritional. Um, on afternoon, they would be like, they're not sleepy. They'll be more focused. And I, I was thinking that it's probably due to what they have eaten on the program that would keep them awake and motivated and alive. So I think that um, the food that is offered to the children, it helps. Um, with their development in school as well. We are the You're viewing the API's Ion Government program. Stay with us, the program continues in just a moment. Read, learn, grow. The children are the future. Help them read, learn, grow. Only reading is the key, so help them read, learn, grow. Let's show them how much fun it is to read, learn, grow. So parents, you play a part. First and foremost, reading from so young is advantageous. Link with the teachers. Working hand in hand is a must. Just 10 minutes of your child reading to you is a plus. Get fun books, make reading priority. When children read, they are able to learn. And the more they learn, the more they grow. So parents help your kids read, learn, grow. Reading is fun, kids have to know. Read, learn. Grow. The children are the future, help them read, learn, grow. So parents, you 
play a part. This message is brought to you by the OECS USAID Early Learners Program, funded by United States Agency for International Development. For more information, log on to www.oecs.org slash ELP. Thanks for staying with us. The local craft industry possesses tremendous potential and the National Cultural Foundation, through a series of workshops, is seeking to boost the capacity of the craft industry to promote this country's indigenous culture and introduce participants to film technology. The NCF received funding through a grant from the Canada Fund for local initiative to the tune of 77,000 Canadian dollars. The API's Bavin Oliver spoke with directors of the National Cultural Foundation, Maxine Brown and Julian Pilling Pollard to get a deeper look at the NCF's work and the contribution from the Canada Fund. The workshops focus on training um, either spruce up skills you have or teaching new ones. Yeah. Do you see these workshops as a means, especially for these women, to create a level of financial independence, considering you know, it's starting in the week of independence? Yes, um, it's about making a living, making financial income. As I said, I think the way forward for St. Vincent is to produce more. You know, um, we have unemployment problems, yes, but Productivity is what is going to take us forward. And where you have a situation with craft in that you're not importing the raw material. The raw material is here. Straw is here, bamboo is here, clay is here, grass is here. And I have noticed that the grass has already taken off. Um, growing time, you know, Miss Rudet has a wonderful program in the prison. And the bamboo, is being worked. So the situation is actually the marketing. This is where our problem may lie. The way that we present our craft, the way that we market the craft. So I'm looking forward to us being able to export and market, not just regionally, locally, but globally, once people are willing to buy. Our project is based on the theme, rebranding the craft industry an artistic response to COVID-19. You know, it's in our faces. As we center the workshop on this, on this overarching project title, boosting the capacity of the craft industry and promoting the indigenous culture of St. Vincent and the Grenadines through workshops on the rebranding of the craft industry and workshops re-introduction to film technology. All in all, we were very elated that our project was successful and so at this time, I want to publicly thank the Canada Funds for Local Initiatives through the High Commission in Barbados for affording us this opportunity to engage our community in areas of craft and film technology. Which is gracias, thank you very much. Through the program, we certainly will be able to network with other trainers in the Caribbean. In fact, Tamisha through the High Commission will be engaging our trainers in that she will link us with trainers who are conducting similar programs happening across the region, so Caribbean integration. We are certainly very happy to facilitate these connections so that we can assume and ensure our program is sound and that we can benefit from the lessons learned in similar areas. As I speak of soundness, Pedin and I, and I say Pedin, but Mr. Julian Pollard and I, we really invest in this project to ensure that it's a success and it comes off well, as we see in local parlance. Because shall we do this project to the best of our ability, we are sure that though they provide funding for one year, we may actually get funding for two years. Correct, Philly? True. And so we plan to work hard to create visibility for this project. That's where we have API and do our best to engage our community. So they will be impressed. After all, they have funded this project. And so our duty is to use the money as well, and that we will do. Now, what we are hoping is that the end result would be that if there have intentions in New York who would like to have some craft, before they would have had to come to St. Vincent. But now they can go online and Google and see the craft and make an order. And we guarantee that they will get it in a period, maybe about two weeks or a little more. Now that we have the Argyle International Airport, these things have been made easy. Um, 
as you know, it happens worldwide. It happens with eBay and a lot of Amazon, all these. So we are saying that we can use this technique and sell our craft overseas. So that first workshop with the 20 ladies will begin next week. Uh, the ladies will receive transportation funds and meal funds. Well, they'll have the meal there. It's going to be from 9 in the morning till 2. And it's 12 sessions that cover the month, three days a week, which would be Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. We did a lot of research, and we found that you know a lot of the ladies, especially traveling from afar, don't want to come to a workshop on Friday. It's the day that they do their business, they take care of home stuff and so. So we try to accommodate them in that way. And um, so far, we have 20 ladies. In fact, we may have more than 20, but because of the COVID situation, because of the restrictions that put on us in terms of health situation, we only can do 20, considering the space that we have. So the second workshop would be for on the leeward side, which again, we have a group of producers from Rose Hall, from Barley, and even at Kittel's, who are very good in their work. And we are going to, again, use the same techniques. So um, the idea, as I said before, is to rebrand the craft. We are going to teach them about the indigenous culture, the historical indigenous culture. Because what we are thinking that with COVID, the tourists were not able to come. But that doesn't mean that we can't reach out to them. But in reaching out to them, I know a lot of people like to know about your country. So if we can sell our Garifuna heritage and our Kalinago heritage, and even our heritage before that, we have all the petroglyphs that were there for so many years. So we are going to incorporate that into the craft. It's in relation to the film components. Uh, I'm sure you can tell just by coming in here. Men are traditionally the ones that deal with videography, which is a very important part of filmography. Um, do you see this as a good way of creating a gender balance in this field? Well, I, in my opinion, I, I, I do see it as a way of creating a gender balance in this field. As you have indicated, for several years, men would have dominated this field. But through this program, we are undertaking. We plan to engage some of the ladies so that they too can capitalize on the training and match woman to man in this gender equality we're trying to create. So I, I do think that in the final analysis, we all will be able to merge resources of both men and women in this particular field that has been dominated by men for several years. Mr. Paula, I know you mentioned um, different aspects as it relates to tourism. Um, do you see this point, the beginning of this workshop, as, let's say, a new beginning for culture and tourism? In the Caribbean now, this gift and craft souvenir market is a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, I think that St. Vincent was underperforming in terms of sales. We had probably the worst souvenirs in the world. But we now need to take a stop, as COVID did for us and say, you know, listen, we can do better. We can now look back at our history and say, if we use our indigenous culture, but we learn from our four parents, and we add new ideas, because one thing you can say is that we are not a creative people. And I have a kind of carnival background that would <laughs> prove that. So we can come up with new ideas, think outside the box, and once we get the marketing right, and people begin to make money, because what I notice in St. Vincent, people gravitate to things that make money. If it's not making money, then they're not going to be in it. So we want the young people to gravitate to the film work, which they should then be able to make a dollar out of, because if they're making advertisements for the craft people and for the local producers to put on Facebook and YouTube and different areas, we have to find means for them to get paid. And if the craft persons are getting paid, then they are going to want to promote their business more. So we are looking forward to actually 
a new dispensation, as I think you were trying to say, that we now want to move forward because it always hurt my heart that the cruise ships would come, but we are not producing the right stuff. What we have to do is have our craft to be market-driven, so you do the research, you know what the people want. Iron government will continue after the break. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers, and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers, rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips, rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Welcome back. The International Day for Universal Access to Information was commemorated on Monday, September 28, 2020. On the local front, the National Public Library joined the celebrations with the hosting of a book exhibition. The theme for the International Day for Universal Access to Information was Access to Information, Saving Lives, Building Trust, Building Hope. VAPI's Janice and Philip has the story. Recognizing that access to learning should be unrestricted, the United Nations Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, has endorsed this initiative by spearheading a series of webinars that took place on Monday, September 28, 2020, along with a publication of a policy brief. In addition, here in SVG, UNESCO Local Office held a book exhibition to mark International Day for Universal Access to Information. This was held on the same day with an array of books and literature on display at the National Public Library. The Agency for Public Information had the opportunity to speak with two persons who have learned how to interpret the world around them, even though they are visually impaired. Danny Chambers and Tally Brown are living proof that the visually impaired can access, learn, interpret, and scan the reality of the environment in different ways, using learning materials specifically designed for them at the library, in the technological sphere, and on other learning platforms. We hear from Danny Chambers and Tally Brown the inspiration behind this special day. At the library here, the thing, materials um, that are available are talking books and how do talking books help the visually impaired, you might ask. Well, a talking book is an audio version of a book. It's in a CD format and um, you can get talking books here and, you know, you can borrow. and. It's basically the same as a book, but just means someone is reading it. So you would put it in a CD player and you would you know, listen. And, you know, we would be able to, you know, get information by different books that we may borrow. And um, other means of um, technology information, we have um, computers here that we can come and listen to talking books on online online that would be available or read the newspaper. I'm sure in the exhibition you saw where there is that um, machine there where you can um, put your newspaper and you know it would scan and it would read. It, it's an audio machine for a visually impaired person it would be able to read the newspaper or we can read the e-paper online. We can come here on a weekly basis and access that. Um, 
the talking books, uh, you know, it would help you to learn a lot because it depends on what talking books. Like, for instance, um, John Grisham, he writes a lot of books, um, mostly about the law and so. So if you want to know certain legal things, you would make sure get a hold of a couple of John Grisham books and listen. The good thing about a talking book is that, you know, you get to actually feel that you are in the book. No, well, I have. I love to read Braille because let me, let's talk. For example, about the Bible. I mean, if I am reading the Bible, I must be able to know um, what verse I am quoting and so on. But if you listen to the CDs on the computer and so on, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get that. Right? But I love to. So that's why I love to read Braille and particularly from the. Bible point of view. Braille is one of my main way of learning and so knowing other things. To know Braille, you, you have to know also to be taught the, the alphabet, where you know, you could get to familiarize yourself with, you know, all the various different letters, 26 letters in the alphabet. And the thing with Braille is it's broken down in six, um, six uh, dots, right? Six dots. Um, and uh, these six dots, these six dots, they, they formalize letters of every kind. So you know an N from a Z, a G from a D, an R from a W, and so on as, as time goes by. Right, and uh, when you put them together in sentences now, you'll be able to identify what you're reading and so on. Danny also gave a brief demonstration as to how he accesses the TalkBack app to retrieve information on his cellular phone. Okay, so TalkBack is basically from, you go to all apps, and then look for settings. Settings, yeah, and then look for accessibility. So, while it's swiping, it's saying? Ah, yeah, it's done. While it's swiping, it's done. Okay, there you have accessibilities and we will find it right. Okay, it's, it would be in here. You would find it in here. Mm. If you look at the screen, you will find it has top back. So once you get to accessibility, top back would be right there. So then once you turn it on, then it would start. Director of Library Services, Michelle King Campbell, spoke about the library being a crucial vantage point for information, as well as an avenue to facilitate learning to the entire population. Books can be accessed in a variety of formats, for example, audiovisual format, CD format, some in digital format. There are also online databases. Soon, the visually impaired will even have more access to audio resources under the Marrakesh Treaty, where the National Public Library is now the focal point of this innovation. Information on the department's activities can also be accessed via our Facebook page. Information can also be accessed through our branch libraries located throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We are not only spaces to gain access, but we also provide the skills and support needed to make use of this information. We must not forget the role that the library plays in providing information in an equitable way that ensures universal access. With universal access to information, transparency and accountability by public officials are more guaranteed and help to empower the populace to better participate in the democratic process. Information is powerful. 
Let's make it universally accessible to all concerned as we celebrate this important day. Librarian of the Documentation Center, Gian Julian, went to detail as to what the book exhibition entails. The exhibition today will feature some of the publications that are available to the general public to access at the National Archives and Documentation Center. These include the Government Gazette, Statutory Rules and Orders, Hansards, Acts, Development Plans, Budget Address, and Colonial Records. Persons can also visit the government website at gov.vc for more information. I encourage all stakeholders within the public sector to ensure that any current and future publication, whether print or digital format, be sent to the Documentation Center, which will ensure the continued fulfillment of our mission to provide an information service to planners, policymakers, technical personnel, and researchers. It is my hope that all governments around the world will be committed to ensuring that all citizens across their respective countries will have access to information so they can make informed decisions, accelerate development, and contribute to economic growth. The National Public Library Archives and Documentation Services are committed to saving lives, building trust, bringing hope. UNESCO Secretariat SVG Janil Henry Rose discussed the different platforms that they utilize to make access to information universal. Now with UNESCO, there are many different programs that we utilize in order for persons for, for the benefits or for us to access information. There are many platforms that we utilize. One, we have the IPDC or the International Program for Development of Communication. That's one way by which we do our job. Another one is the EFAP program, the Information for All program. And all this program basically does is provide the leeway for discussion and for building policies, for helping countries to assist them with developing an avenue whereby we can reach the UN sustainable goal that is um, I think it's 16.10.2 where it says to where it says to promote peace and inclusive societies for sustainable development which also includes accessing information for lifelong learning. The International Day for Universal Access to Information 2020 will commemorate its first UN-wide celebration of the International Day, which was established by the 74th UN General Assembly 2019, four years after its introduction by UNESCO's General Conference. I am Janice St. Philip, reporting for the API. You're viewing Eye on Government. The program continues in just a moment. Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and partners. Thanks for staying with us. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Digital Dialogues continued on Thursday, September 24, 2020. The interactive session saw Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Timothy Antwine, along with faith-based leaders from Dominica, St. Kitts and Monsterrat, tackling the subject of pandemic and faith. We bring you an excerpt of the online session. <music> Some of our very hardworking frontline warriors, as I call them, mm -hmm. the health workers, have in fact, some of them succumbed yes. um, to the disease. But others have also become so despondent about perhaps the response to the disease and so on, that some of them lost hope. 
Yes. And for many, those who are people of faith, what has sustained them in this period is not their knowledge of the disease, but their faith in their God. Yes. To help them, as you said, the mental fortitude in the, in, in the face of great adversity. Um, so for those of us who are people of faith, we, we appreciate that. We are, understand that not everybody, uh, I suppose, exercises that faith. There are people's right to faith lessness, if you, if you want to call it that. Yeah. But for many, many of us, faith has been a great sustainer, our faith in our God, a great sustainer in the spirit. And I could attest to that personally. No question about that. Yes, and uh, if I can add yeah. um, yes. to what uh, the um, bishop was saying, indeed, I think we have to acknowledge um, the, the, the holistic uh, development of individuals and to appreciate that, uh, as mentioned by the, the bishop, that we are whole entire individuals and, and the, the entire system has to be fed. I mean, in the context of faith, uh, the church uh, operates within a community. And I think that that faith community is absolutely necessary as the scripture tells us that, you know, I mean, iron sharpened iron. And when we come together, we can build each other. We can grow and feed from each other. That is why even during the, the lockdowns, and we had um, virtual and digital and, and all different types of uh, engagements, it was still not the same uh, as uh, coming together because there is something that nourishes and feeds the soul. And I think that that engagement is absolutely necessary in terms of having the individual appreciate the, the overall impact of faith in their lives to the extent, as you mentioned, Governor, that we find today, even in the healing process, that doctors are sending patients home and say, go and let the church pray for you, which was something unheard of before. I think um, it's already been said this evening that we are resilient people. And a lot of what undergirds our personal resilience is really our faith in God. Yes. We, we, we often don't name it as such. But when you look back on, even you go back to our history, yeah. the fact that we are descendants, you know, of of enslaved Africans and all of the hardship and adversity we endured to cross um, mm -hmm. and then of course to, 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 to live under this most cruel of situations um, to deal with all that we've done within colonialism and all the challenges of small states in the post-independence period, all of the natural disasters and all the things that we face as a people. <coughs> we have shown resilience, health, the issue of health has arisen as a big issue in this period. Let's face it, the people who are suffering the chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease, they are more vulnerable at higher risk to this disease. Right. And so it has brought to the fore the issue of health and of course our primary health care, which is prevention. And the role of the church, some churches, for example, the Adventists have a stronger tradition in respect mm -hmm. of health and wellness. Other churches less so. Uh, but in this moment, all churches, as you said, can work across denominational lines to address this issue of health and health of, 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 the, of the members uh, and of the community, because we're seeing this is not just, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's really, you know, really now come to the fore as important for us to be able to, to survive this pandemic. Um, and tied to that is the issue of food security. And Sister Tewitt made the point earlier about us eating local food and healthy food. And uh, we cultivating a taste for local, but recognizing the importance of local food for our health and the role of the church, which has a captive audience, to be able to empower and, and it, it, its members um, to be able to understand these issues uh, and, and to be better able to, to, um, to help themselves in respect of this. And we could talk about financial literacy, uh, economic development, small business, uh, so there are a whole range of issues, you're right, that the church, some churches have done, but there's an opportunity for us to go to scale, uh, but we have to work across boundaries. We have to work with partners to be able to bring that expertise to, the, to, our, to our church members, to the community, uh, communities that we serve, and in so doing, empower them. Uh, and when we empower them, we not only empower our churches, but we empower our nation. At this time, we have to 
put works in motion. We need to, yes, we preach about faith and hope and all of those nice things, but we need to put it in action. We need to leave the, the walls, the four walls of the church and get out into the community. There are persons over there, they're unemployed and they're hurting. So my thing is, a lot of persons in the church, they are trained in pastoral care. We can assign persons to deal with persons who are depressed or persons who really they're burdened by the situation and they, they don't know what else to do. Apart from that, the church can have little projects. I know the churches, especially your churches, they have reserves. So they can use some of that reserve or get small grants to help some of these people. And I'm talking not just the church people, the persons in the communities. There is a question uh, from one. What is the panelist's view about individuals who refuse to don masks at church gatherings? citing the need to exercise faith in God to keep us safe. Going uh, according to the polls we had just a while ago, and uh, community ranking the highest in the, in the polls of what is most needed um, by the public, um, I think, you know, the fact that people ought to be, or they are, and it ought to be community-minded is, is, is an indication of our responsibility to community. Um, I mean, I don't like the mask, and I'm sure most people don't like the mask, but it is a protective measure for the sake of the community. And, um, and in that regard, I think um, sacrifice is needed. We need to make the sacrifice um, to, to accommodate others so that everybody will be safe. So that is my response. <laughs>Public is asked to take note of the following announcement. Public assistance for the month of October 2020 will be paid in the following areas on the following dates from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Monday 5th, Fancy, Owea, Sandy Bay, Overland and Connery. Tuesday 6th, Kittels, Vermont, Leu, Bocament and Kingstown. Kingstown will now be paid at the Geese Shed Boxing Plant. Thursday 8th, Lomans Windward, Greggs, Bayabu, Maraqua, Stubbs, Calico, and Belair. Friday 9th, Chateau Belair, Spring Village, Coles Hill, Rose Bank, and Rose Hall. Revenue Office, Thursday 8th, Georgetown. Tuesday 13th, Barley. Thursday 15th, Myro, Union Island, and Canwan. Friday 16th, Bequi. All missed payments will be paid on Friday, October 16th, 2020 at the Geeshed Boxing Plant. All persons collecting public assistance are asked to walk with their ID cards. Persons will only be allowed to collect public assistance for a maximum of two persons. For more information, you can visit our Facebook page at API SVG. Here's where we end this evening's Iron Government presentation, a production of the Agency for Public Information. Join us again on Saturday at 5 p.m. for Inside Story. For recaps and further updates, visit our social media platforms at API SVG. On behalf of the API team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lois. Good night.